Hello, hello, and welcome. This is Aluchi, and I am the owner and founder of The Covey Cauldron, where I write and publish poems, short stories, as well as articles about TV and movies and lifestyle and travel. Today, however, instead of writing, I am going to talk to you guys. And we are going to be talking about addictions and vices. How many times have we heard somebody say, we're lucky it's not drugs or alcohol or sex? And my question to that is, are we really, are we really lucky that it's not that? I recently read an article, right, where the writer happened to be a kid of a prominent figure here in the U.S. And she wrote about her battle with the drug known as Coke. Um, her story, which I will not rehearse here, is not new. In fact, it parallels that of many others, although their reasons of engaging slightly differs from you know one another. In her case, though, there was the underlying issue of teenage angst because she got, she got into it when she was a teenager. So uh, teenage angst, hormones, her parents' divorce, along with feelings of not measuring up to her popular peers and measuring up to the success of her parents as well. One of the things I kept thinking about, though, when I after I finished reading the article was how so many things boil down to how we feel, how we feel mostly about ourselves, but also about others, how we feel about our environment, our circumstances, our experiences, especially if they are traumatic. Um, she liked the way the drug made her feel the first time, so she just kept chasing that high, trying to get to that point again, even though it was destructive to her. And she fell, fell back into addiction again after recovering for a while. She fell back again when she found out that a close friend started dating her ex and et cetera, et cetera. But thankfully, at the end, she was able to, you know, get out of it and get help. And she wrote the, she wrote the article as someone like from a place of, oh, this is what I went through, not from a place of this is what I'm currently going through. But the thing is, the thing that I started thinking about is, if it is not actu- like outwardly causing harm, or if it doesn't fall into the bucket of extremes that we throw hard drugs and extreme kinks into, we don't call it addiction. We, we call it a vice or sometimes a behavior or a habit. Um, now, I haven't dealt with addiction as it relates to drugs or sex or alcohol. So this podcast is not to trivialize what anyone that's currently battling it is going through. And if you are, please, please, please get professional help. The base definition of addiction that I found on healthdirect.gov.au is the strong physical or psychological need or urge to do or use something and depend on it, even though you know that it causes you harm and can impact your daily life. But as a citizen of the world that we live in, I have noticed that addiction can come in other forms, forms like, you know, like our coping mechanisms, comfort behaviors, even like escapism, like what they do for us, you know, why we run to them. Uh, This does not mean that, you know, any behavior someone engages in or loves to engage in or a job they do or the way they kick back and have fun and their obsessions are an addiction or trauma response. This is not, I am not arguing that that is what it is. I'm just saying that we need to look at some of these comfort behaviors and the way we escape from, you know, when bad things are happening or when we don't feel our best. And there's this saying that I'm sure every culture has a similar version, but the saying in Nigerian pidgin English is, everybody gets something where they do am, which is essentially that, you know, we all have our thing. We all have our little quirks and kinks and our little 
vices that we engage in. And this brings up the comparison of good vices, you know, the ones that enhance certain parts of our lives versus bad vices, the one that end up derailing our lives and our goals for, you know, and they all of a sudden they turn into this thing where, oh, I didn't know she was addicted to spending so much money. So I guess we can qualify that as a, I guess, a bad vice. Now, I'm sure someone out there will try to argue with me about how the good vices and the bad vices deserve equal treatment and love and blah, blah, blah. And to that I say, you know, first for a period of time, then go into a quiet room, make your argument. After you do that, listen for a second and your stomach will answer you. Thank you. But I digress. Anyways, if we compare uh, something like wonder lost, like, you know, traveling, like constant travel. Someone just can't sit still. They just can't stay in their apartment that they're paying rent for, for like two, three days. They are off to another location. If we compare wonder lost to shopping sprees, one of them is mostly frowned upon, while the other one is seen as interesting and cool. Even if, now I'm not saying those things are people, people doing it are like they are from a trauma response or whatever but even if they are doing they are both doing these things like one of them is traveling constantly and the other one is shopping constantly even if they are both doing it from you know for a similar feeling we also see this the same thing as i know we can't say gambling and stock market is essentially the same thing but the argument can be made that it's the same thing when you compare stock market, someone that likes to invest and trade stocks versus someone that likes to gamble in the, in the casino. One of them is frowned upon, the other one is not. So I guess I'm just trying to give examples of, you know, good and bad vices that, you know, that way I can set the stage for what, I, what I'm getting to here. Also, I am not a therapist but I am a member of the society that we live in and I would like to continue this conversation and hear your opinions as well. So leave me a comment, let me know how you feel and be respectful about it. Thank you. Um, and I know this conversation is a slippery, like a slippery slope. I know the, the potential it has to become that. So I would like to reiterate again that I'm not saying that every behavior someone loves or likes to engage in, or finds comfort in, or obsessively love as a job is an addiction. That is not what I'm saying. Okay, we can be addicted to feelings, whether they are pro productive or not. Um, we can be addicted to anger, feeling like a victim, because we've programmed ourselves through constantly feeling that way, that it just becomes, that just becomes what we escape to. Even if something is not angering us, we find something to be angry about. Even if something is not, someone is not treating us a certain way, we find a way to like tell ourselves that that's how they are treating us, you know? So that, the addiction can also be like, you know, it can create behavioral patterns and the stories that constant self-narrative, the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and what we can achieve. And some examples that we don't readily think of when we think addiction are food, especially junk food, overeating food, you know, concurrent loop of just mother mysteries and just sad stories, like everything has to be dreary and gooey. We don't think, we don't think of those things as addictions. Uh, social media, you know, just constantly on the, you know, if, it, if you're not, I understand if you do a job, if you're like, your job is connected to social media, or if you're a news reporter and your job is connected to that, you have to check the news every time. Like, I understand those things. But if you have the privilege of not having that as a job, and you're like on there 247, if that's the way you distress and it's not causing you any harm, by all means, go for it. But if it's constantly like, in, you know, 
impeding your mental health, then why not seek help? But we don't see those things. At least many people don't see them as addictions. They just see them as, oh, I'm just on, I'm just on social media all the time. It's annoying, but I just want to be there. <laughs> so, you know, and some of these things we find comfort in them. You know, when we are hurting or when we want to pass time, sometimes we genuinely enjoy them. So if you genuinely enjoy them, then this does not apply to you. And that's why addiction to them can fly under the radar and then build up to a blow up that we perceive as, you know, as sudden. But at the beginning, they were just innocent vices, right? I'm not a Puritan by any means, nor do I believe in the tight leash. But I know that personal power and self-knowledge can bring us closer to change or at least mitigate the gravity of the harm you know that we're causing to ourselves right it's also not lost on me that this is the self-actualization part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you you get your basics met and then at the top is like okay now how can I start improving my in our work and my behavior and so it's not lost on me that you know someone that your mindset is how do i make the next the next money to like put a roof over my head is not really going to be concerned about about this and that is fine we all get you know places when we get there right so if you are struggling i would like to say that again please seek the appropriate professionals to get help However, if you are in a stage where these quote-unquote vices are still manageable, here are some helpful tips to deal. Number one, self-knowledge. Get to know yourself. Get to know your triggers. Get to know your breaking points. And take them seriously. One person's one might be another person's hundred. So if you have a bunch of friends and you all love to watch your mother mysteries as a way to relax... And, you know, those shows where they tell you the killer is amongst you in plain clothes, just, a, just like everybody else. It, those, those shows, right? So let's say you love to watch those. It, it's you guys are staying and you watch them before bed. And then all of a sudden you start having sleepless nights and you're like paranoid. And when you ask them, they're not having the same experience. It's not affecting them the same way it's affecting you. Now, knowing yourself and knowing how this is triggering you or affecting you, it will behoove you to either stop watching it completely, which is what I will do, or see how you feel when you watch it outside in the middle of the day, when you limit the frequency of your watching. And, um, you know, that way you're not watching it closer to bedtime or watching it right where you wake up where it's affecting your mental health. But if something is affecting your mental health and it's something that you used to enjoy before, but now it's just become a big burden, then stop, stop it. Even if it's not affect, even if it used to be a thing and it's not affecting the other people that you used to do these things with, it's not affecting them the same way it's affecting you, but it's affecting you. Stop it. Know yourself and stop it. And this leads, leads to the se- second point I have, which is self-censorship. So number two, self-censorship. And by this, I don't, I don't necessarily mean censoring what comes out of your mouth, but you, of course you should watch yourself. We live in a, a society with other human beings, so you should watch yourself. But by this, I mean censoring the types of things that you let into your mind space, whether it's negative self-talk or dreary and draining energy, stories that are draining and, you know, or people that are draining, like just censoring things that you let in to influence you. You know how a big part of adulting, even though we don't, we don't really think about that, is not just providing food and shelter for yourself. It's also now those things that your parents and your caregiver did, things like not allowed, allowing you to watch a certain movie at a certain time. Now you have to also do that for yourself. Now you don't just... Because sometimes we think we are uninfluencible. We are on 
untouchable. Like we think that. But now it's the onus is now on you to do that for yourself. To like just if something is affecting you a certain way, then stop engaging with it. Find out what has and also finding out what has emotional impact on you. If you're someone that, you know, prides yourself on being an informed citizen and, you know, you like to read your news every day, fine. Then maybe start reading it in the afternoon. That way you're not reading it immediately you wake up or select a day of the week to catch up on the news. If if the news is like too depressing for you, maybe do those things. Or if it's um something that you also watch because of weather advisory, then maybe do something before you go and watch that. Maybe when you wake up in the morning, just do something to just get yourself in your groove. And then after that, then go and watch your news. But find ways to like reduce that impact on your mental and emotional health. If it's If reading has more impact on you, then maybe stop reading, start watching it. If watching has more impact on you, then maybe start reading, reading the news, you know, find out ways that you can balance out your lifestyle without it being detrimental to your mental and emotional health. That's essentially what I'm saying. Number three, systems and new habits. Put systems in place to balance out devices that are detrimental to you, which is kind of what I touched on when I talked about self-censorship. And for example, if you shop a lot and it has become a problem, of course, seek help. But if it's not to the point where, you know, it's become like so detrimental, then put systems in place to balance out your spending. Maybe set up a your paycheck in a way that a certain amount of money goes to your savings automatically. You don't even see it. It just goes in there. And then a certain amount of money automatically set up, you know, rent and every other thing so that it just goes in. So that when you're left with, you know, whatever you're left with in the end, you can now knock yourself out with shopping. If that's what your vice is, I guess. Um, If you're... If you're going to the casino, maybe leave all your other cards at home and just carry cash. Uh, get a better job and have multiple sources of income. That way you can fund, you know, your lifestyle that you've chosen for yourself. And then hope, hopefully you, you snap out of it before you retire. That way you're not going crazy after you retire because now you're shopping a lot. And you don't have much money coming in again. And... Or build other habits to balance it out. If the seeking of novelty is at the root of, you know, you shopping a lot or buying more stuff, maybe see if you can get any other new habits. If it's traveling, that way it can temper the need to buy new things. If it's taking up a new sport, learning a new skill or craft, that where you can find novelty in other things that are not just that habit of shopping. So build other habits that have that um that quality of novelty that you're seeking in in that in just that one vice that's you know about to ruin your life. <laughs> so essentially that's what I'm saying. Find other habits and other ways to seek out that feeling that you're looking for instead of fixating on just that one that you've gotten comfortable with. Another number four, have a support system. Even if it's just two or three people, work on cultivating a community of people that are in your corner. It is a challenging thing to do. I know, I know. As we get older, we just want to not even bother with people anymore, <laughs> but, but keep looking until you find them. It doesn't even matter if it's just two or three people, but people that are in your corner that can see your blind spot and call it out if you're falling off the rails. If You know that when you're beginning to do something weird and you're in denial about it, but your friends can see it, 
Yeah, so even if it's just one or two people, have those people. And when you find them, be that person for them as well. Because there's nothing I hate more than leeches. I like, I like reciprocating relationships. I shouldn't say leeches, I should say parasites. Right? So if you find those people, be that person for them as well. Don't just take, 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 take. Also give, give to them. Um, so my last point which is number five, is know when to seek professional help. If, if this has passed the stage of where you can comfortably call it a manageable vice, then seek professional help. If your so-called vice is making it harder to function in daily life or causing harm to your life, if you'd rather, you know, if you'd rather wear the latest Gucci than pay rent, or if you'd rather gamble or bet on sports with the family money when you can barely afford necessities, this is, and this is just an example, seek help. So I just wanted us to look into other areas of life and other behaviors. Of course, we've established in the beginning that not all your behaviors are trauma behaviors or uh, some of those things you just genuinely enjoy and love. But I would like us to look more into other ways that we escape because there's this big thing that it's just drugs and alcohol and sex and extreme gangs. And if you have the other ones, well, people are waking up to it now, but Mostly, if you have the other things, you're safe. It's not as bad as this thing. But it can also be just as bad. Even if you're fine with it, even if it doesn't really ruin your life, if you have a family, if you have children and, you know, a wife and you're like the breadwinner and you have a gambling problem, it's it's going to impact not just you but them also so it's it's best to seek um help when you find what these things are and if they're just you know they're you know they're causing a little bit of problem but not much problem find ways and if they are things that you genuinely enjoy but you're being so so dependent on them to the point where you know they're beginning to impact other areas of your life in a negative way find ways to mitigate them talk to a professional get help before it becomes a big stumbling block that way you can cushion your fall you know but anyways this concludes our first podcast at the curry cauldron so i'm so excited thank you thank you thank you for sticking with me and see you next time